today on Doomed! What a year it has been. Ladies and gentlemen, on this episode of Doomed with Matt Binder, we will be talking about what has happened in the past year. One year ago, March 11th, 2020, at least here in the United States, everything changed. And on this program, we'll talk about all that and how that led to a huge uprising in the anti-vaxxer, anti-masker, well, a creation of an anti-masker in the first place here, uh, conspiracy theorists and how they were basically uh, grabbed by the right for their own influence. Um, well, let me, first thing I should do is pull us up here on the feed. Let me take down the intro uh, logo. Oh, give me one second here. Do, do. Oh, what? Always messing this up. Always pressing the wrong thing. There we go. And I should introduce you to my guest for the day, for the day, for the episode. Devin Burghardt. He is the executive director of the Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights. Devin, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Oh, hey, Matt. It's great to be back. Now, apologies for uh, for the slow motion <laughs> intro and and introduction uh, for you, Devin. Uh I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it all way down. This whole past year, it's all it's all hitting me today at once. Do you, do you sort of have that feeling as you know? Because uh, I guess at the stage here, March eleventh, twenty twenty, one year ago today, uh, Donald Trump goes out there and announces that uh, his this big COVID speech, and he announces that we're shutting down travel with Europe. Um, the NBA completely shuts down after a few of their players. Uh, get tested positive for COVID, which was like the first big like uh, COVID detection here in the country. Like you know, it was it was uh, starting to spread in different nursing homes across the country and starting starting out like that. But then this was like the first time I really think it hit most of America. And you know, a lot of uh, offices uh, uh, answered the call to, and started shutting down and, and telling people to work from home. Uh, we'll all also remember that Sarah Palin uh, showed up on that uh, dancing show where they unmask the dancers. I don't remember what that's called, but uh, <laughs> do you remember that, Devin? Do you remember all that, Devin, especially the Sarah Palin thing? <laughs> Feels like a thousand years ago, but yeah, I think I have a vague recollection of some of that. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, I I just I was thinking about it today, and it's just like, man, what what a what a year! And before we 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 went live on the show here, I I was t talking about how you know contra contrast uh, that Trump speech I just mentioned with now three hundred sixty five days later, Joe Biden coming out and saying that. Uh, he expects every state in the country to roll out vaccinations for everyone, not just people over 65 plus or uh, immunocompromised people, everybody by May 1st, which is, is huge. And he expects uh, that rollout to mostly, you know, have everyone vaccinated by, I think he said July 4th, which yeah. sounds more like, a, a, you know, a, not really a scientific date so much as a it's more inspirational, yeah. Right. I, like a hurrah America Independence Day, right. I'm sure, you know, just like, you know, here in New York, Andrew Cuomo reopened the restaurants uh on February fourteenth. It just so happens that the science uh said that uh the restaurants could reopen on Valentine's Day when uh, all the restaurants would make tons of money. Just what a cool yeah. Right. Just oh. how these things work sometimes, you know? Uh, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> But I brought you here today because, uh, man, you came on this program for the first time in April of last year. Smack. I think it was April. I'm like 99 percent sure it was April. Yeah, April. I think so, too. Smack dab in the middle of the lockdowns. It was, uh, uh, you know, what, what a weird time in general, like mid-March to uh, late June, I want to say. Uh what a weird time. I don't know if we'll ever experience that again in our lifetime. It's just that. Oh, let's hope not. That yeah. Was, uh, certainly, 
not one I want to live through again. It was uh, remarkable in so many different ways. And, and, and you came on this show to basically let people know that, you know, amid all these uh, far, uh, excuse me, amid all of these, you know, anti-mask, anti-lockdown uh, rhetoric that was being passed around on Facebook and Twitter and probably hearing on the phone when you called family members to find out how mom, dad, grandpa, brother, sister... Uh, son, daughter, we're doing. Uh, hearing these things from them as well. Uh, how these, this rhetoric, these COVID conspiracies, were basically being taken by the right and used to their own advantage. And you know, what one specific uh, one that I I remember quite well. Uh. Maybe not that well because I can't remember the name of the guy. But this guy ran one of the most prominent uh, – er, I don't know about now, but early on one of the most prominent COVID-dedicated podcasts. And it came out that the dude was a white nationalist. And he was like secretly putting some of this white nationalist rhetoric – it, like covertly, like, you know, not like he was like some secret agent stuff, but I mean, like, you know, just drop it. He, he wasn't openly promoting his white nationalist beliefs. He was just doing a COVID uh, podcast and, you know, dropping some of that rhetoric in there. Uh, do you recall this guy? I do. I don't remember his name, but I remember that he was a, you know, he was a pretty hardcore white nationalist who figured out early in the game that he could wrap his message inside the kind of COVID conspiracy language and use it as a way to kind of soft pedal his stuff. Um, you know, he had a quick, it kind of burned out quickly after he was exposed, but um, it really provided a template for a lot of people to kind of do that same dance to try to use the COVID, in, you know, COVID moment to recast their insurrection in a different kind of light. So why don't you give us a update? Uh, let's let's get right into this. Why don't as I, you know, I've already uh, talked about uh, my feelings of the past year and how how it's completely worn me down. Uh, why don't you give us an update? How how has everything changed or not changed? I mean, I, I when you came on this show, the big thing was the anti lockdown reopen. Move, the reopen movement and the anti-lockdown protests. Why don't you tell us where we've moved in terms of what the far right is now uh, focusing on when it comes to COVID? Because it's obviously still big business. It's still affecting every day. This is their opportunity to still uh, uh, seep their own worldview into the national conversation. Let's get into this. Yeah, let's do Uh you know, that's a great place to start with those early anti-lockdown protests, because in so many ways they created the model that um, eventually set the stage for the January 6th insurrection and have really reshaped Republican politics writ large over the past several months. You know, you could go back to uh, last April, you know, th the very first of those anti-lockdown protests occurred in Idaho uh, and it was led by Ammon Bundy and his group, his new group at that time, People's Rights, uh, where they were decided that they were gonna hold an Easter celebration in in violation of the Idaho's anti-lockdown, Idaho's lockdown uh, rules. And that kind of disobedience set the stage for other groups to do the same. It kind of gave them permission because they didn't see any pushback to Bundy. He got away with it. There was nothing that happened. So other groups started replicating that, and we saw that rapidly proliferate around the country. So you saw lots of these protests amplifying the kind of intensity and the the volubility of them on the ground. And so there were literally at one point hundreds of them taking place every week um, to kind of push both the anti-lockdown message as well as you know COVID conspiracies, anti-masker messages, uh, COVID denialism. And it also created a space for things like QAnon to find a home inside the larger anti-lockdown community because of the commonality of conspiracy theory theories. So it kind of brought them all together, S move forward a little bit longer. And then you suddenly had, after the incident in Idaho, you had the 
the protests inside the Capitol in Michigan and Wisconsin, where armed protesters broke into the Capitol and were attempting to prevent um, any further attempts to do changes to lockdown restrictions there. You saw that kind of emphasis take hold nationally. So you saw this merger in a lot of respects for, with uh, you know, the conspiracists on the one hand, the gun nuts on the other, and the folks who were concerned about the lockdown and about reopening. Um, and they really began a kind of synergy to working together to remold the kind of politics around COVID and create what we were calling at that point kind of the COVID insurrection, because they really were aimed at putting an end to any kind of health measures to stop the pandemic from spreading, as well as bringing in anti-vaxxers and stuff to protest against the vaccine once it was rolled out. So that has been really one of the glues that has bound together a lot of the far right over the past year. And they've used that to expand their base pretty dramatically. You know, at their height, on Facebook alone, we were tracking around 1,180 different Facebook groups that had this kind of profile, that had a combined membership of 3.2 million, right? That were constantly getting fed this never-ending diet of conspiracies like the pandemic and, you know, the QAnon stuff and, you know, militia type conspiracies, all of it just ever circulating in that ecosystem, reinforcing itself in that in that framework to the point where now, not only do they have that mass base created, but that mass base is now also influencing Republican politics and potentially preventing us from moving forward and reaching that herd immunity we need to fully reopen again. Right, right. Speaking of Republican politics, like you mentioned, I mean, Lauren Boebert is one of those people who last year took full advantage of raising her profile during the lockdown measure. She runs a restaurant in Colorado called Shooters. It's a gun themed <laughs> restaurant. Big oh, yeah. is there. Um, and I, I distinctly remember her starting this fundraiser because they received I, I think they actually reopened when the lockdown was still going on and they were fined and got you know shut down by the authorities. And she really took advantage of it to raise her profile and fast forward to November 2020 and she gets elected to uh, U.S. Congress. She's now a sitting House member uh, yeah. bringing her gun to uh, <laughs> to uh, D.C. and making videos about carrying her gun around in D.C. And I know, yeah. you know I, I know I know a lot of people connect her with uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. And Marjorie Taylor Greene certainly used the uh, the lockdown stuff as well. But I, I do feel like Marjorie Taylor Greene's ticket to success was her direct connection with the QAnon world, whereas Boebert more, more so relied on uh, the lockdown stuff. I, I don't know if you agree with that assessment. Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. I think Boebert is the best example of that. But we're currently working on another project where we're looking at the influence of this stuff at the state level. And there are countless, I mean, we're up to hundreds almost of state legislators who are, have engaged in the kind of COVID insurrection activity over the past year. So it's not surprising that in addition to the myriad of ways the Trump administration messed up dealing with a pandemic, that in a number of states, they're having so much more trouble because there are state legislators who are actively impeding attempts to fight the pandemic. Right, right. Someone, uh, a listener on the Majority Report when I was hosting earlier today, actually, uh, to show that I actually do listen to all of you uh, listeners out there, uh, they told me to look into a, a state senator in Pennsylvania uh, named Russ Diamond. I don't know if that name sounds familiar to you. But oh, yeah. yeah. He, he is a hardcore, uh, you, you name it, anti-masker, anti-lockdown guy, straight up wants everything to reopen. Um, I don't, I don't know if he's an anti-vaxxer. I didn't get that deep into reading about him quite yet. Uh, wouldn't surprise me though. Uh, you know, it, it's yep, the, me the, the, the state level, like you said, it, it does seem like well, there's a real problem there. And these are the people who obviously are, are making a lot of these decisions uh, uh, at a local, at a local level. 
Yeah. And those who, you know, those who believe actually believe the pandemic is real and are trying to fight it are also up against these protests, right? You have, for instance, Bundy's group, People's Rights, for instance, has publicly threatened public health officials in places like Idaho and Washington State, literally showing up at people's homes to protest them doing things like enforcing lockdown provisions. Um, they have invaded hospitals with armed, you know, armed, trying to stop patients from being COVID tested. They have uh, prevented vaccine distributions, and they have done, you know, so many different things to just make it more difficult to fight the pandemic. And then I think what's really challenging, it's really, really scary, is that there was a, there's a new poll out by the Kaiser Family Foundation released, you know, recently. I forget exactly when, but it showed that. Because of this, largely because of this ecosystem that's been so influential now, 28% of Republicans say they would definitely not get vaccinated. And another 18% of those say they'd wait to see before getting the shot. You know, that number is enough to make it impossible for the country to reach herd immunity and make it possible for us to reopen. So it's one of those examples where the kind of nutty conspiracy theories are going to have a real world impact because people are buying into this garbage. Right, right. I, I, that that's where I think it's going. Like you know, a lot of people were probably thinking when uh, Donald Trump lost the election and Biden was inaugurated in January on January twenty twentieth, probably thinking, oh, all those conspiracy theories and all that stuff. Oh, QAnon had their big failure on January sixth. The insurrection didn't work out as they planned. Biden was inaugurated. Uh, Trump wasn't inaugurated on March fourth, like they all thought was secretly going to happen. Um, you know, the, these this stuff must be going away. I actually think it's not going to be going away. I mean, conspiracy theories in general aren't going away. But I think we're moving into, going to move into, in the coming months, something much worse. Like Biden said May 1st, it, everything starts uh, is the deadline for all the states to start rolling out vaccinations for everyone. I feel like that's when you will see the anti-vaxxer stuff, as it relates to COVID at least, start its peak i mean it's going yep. to be insane i think i mean right right now what you have the va people are getting vaccinated but these are people who wanted the vaccine these are people who are seeking out vaccinations they are signing up for it they're waiting on long lines uh they're searching for the proper websites and and, and trying to log in at the right time to get a perfect <laughs> date and schedule time um yep. you know so yep. these are people yep. who really want this vaccine but what happens when all those people are vaccinated, which, you know, a lot of people, but not the majority of people, what happens when the majority of people start getting vaccinated and there is a significant amount of them who aren't seeking the vaccine or are, in fact, actively avoiding the vaccine? They're going to be spreading this stuff like wildfire. I think it's going to be the worst that it's been, even worse than during the lockdowns when people were sitting home and bored or had nothing to do and were just spending all their time online. Uh, I mean, it's going to be bad, I think. Yeah, I mean, already we're hitting that at this one-year mark where everyone wants to rush to get everything opened and return to normal, you know, tomorrow. So that pressure is already building. And what we're seeing develop on the far right are essentially two different strains moving forward. You know, one is that continue to push the disinformation and conspiracies to boost up um, vaccine hesitancy to discourage people from getting the vaccine. And then the other tact are those groups which are preparing for more militancy, you know, to get in and to stop people from getting the vaccine when we get to the point of further math, mass uh, vaccine distribution sites or, you know, additional rollouts. We anticipate seeing more of those kind of activities you know, there was an incident in in Europe just uh, about a week ago where uh, an individual blew up a uh, a bomb at a vaccine distribution site. And so we, you know, given that that kind of activity has already been threatened here, you know, there was an arrest back last spring, I think in May, of an individual who was looking to blow up a, a hospital that... Um, in Missouri that held COVID-19 patients. Um, we anticipate seeing more of that kind of militancy going forward as well from some of these far right groups who have really ramped up that kind of rhetoric. Um, 
And for those who don't go that far as to engage in the kind of civil war type activity, there are still plenty more who are going to use COVID as one of those pivots away from the January 6th insurrection um, to kind of rebrand themselves and looking forward, try to use it as a way to create a united opposition against the Biden administration. Right, right. Uh, have you seen these? Uh, there was a video going around of an Idaho mask burning party where yep. a bunch of people, little kids included, around a, uh, like a garbage can throwing their that's flame of lit a fire inside of it. Uh, and, uh, uh, I think it's fire lit a flame. I did it reverse, uh, inside the garbage and, um, they're throwing their masks in there and that's it. That's it. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, they're probably emboldened by the, uh, governors of States like in Texas who basically reopened everything. No more masks, nothing just to go out there. Everything's fine. I mean, it's it's they're already acting as I mean, they, they've been acting like they didn't have to listen to this stuff for for months and months and months anyway. But we're already at a point where we're so close. But they, they're just not holding to that point. I mean, we were like I just said before, you know, and it's not just places like that who are just doing it like uh, full throttle, like your usual Republican governors in red states. We we see it in uh in New York too, where where governors in blue states are are same here, Michigan state, yeah, are, are giving in to to I guess pressure they're feeling from from lobby groups or or businesses, uh, and opening up faster than they really should be. I mean, we're just so close. I'm, like, listen, there's gonna be people who die in these next. I mean, already I think I feel like if 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 you if you're if you're someone who dies over these next few months. I mean, that's really sad. You were, you lived through the whole main portion of the pandemic and, and you, you almost got there and then the country decided to bungle these final remaining. I mean, obviously uh, we don't know if COVID's going away like that forever, which is because of these vaccinations. And I, I'm sure people will still pass from it, but like the numbers are going to be obviously so much smaller from what we've seen with how, how well the vaccines work and what uh, uh, scientists and and officials uh, like the CDC are saying, basically, you know, hell, these are working so good that grandparents can go visit their grandkids without wearing masks, even if their grandkids aren't vaccinated, which obviously uh, who knows when young people can get vaccinated. That's not even on the on the docket right now. People under the age of, I think, 13 or 12, something like that. Yeah, it's it's they're way down there. I think that, you know, no one, I think, has ever said that patience is an American value. We are not good as a country at being patient. And this is one of those times where we really need that extra, that extra step to make sure that we're, that we get through this together. And the political pressure that's coming from these groups on the far right is resonating and scaring even blue state governors to do, um, you know, to react far more quickly than they, than they can and should uh, and so that's just further compounding the problem. Like the sooner we do this now, the longer it's going to be before we can get back to normal. It's just the basic science of it all. And it is exasperating on so many levels to see a rush to this once again, right? Because, you know, looking back again, like we were before, we've gone through this period where we did this rush to reopen again because of the political pressure. And then it led to that massive second wave that hit in November and December and cost so many more lives. So there is that value to being patient and, you know, looking out for your neighbor and making sure that you're safe, that everyone around you is safe by taking these extra precautions until it's okay to, to start moving forward. So, so what have you seen in terms of where this is going? Obviously, uh, since you've been on the show, uh, 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 you know, obviously the social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube have really amped up their their moderation for COVID conspiracy theories and misinformation. Uh, they've also recently, over the last few months, really. Uh, hunkered down on focusing on vaccination misinformation what 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 have you seen in terms of how this has affected these usual uh far right uh channels and 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 personalities what what's 
what's the play here for them? Are the, are they just basically going to try to test what they can do and 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 try to be careful, or or are they just saying like screw it, let's just you know go go all out, and if we get you know we get deplatformed, whatever, we'll just move to Gab or Parler. I think what's happened largely is, at least for Facebook, w- which is the obviously the platform of choice because it has the most r- mainstream reach. Uh, the COVID insurrectionists as a whole are largely still intact. Most of those 1,100 groups are still active on Facebook. Um, They still use it as a platform, and they still use it as an amplifying mechanism for other ideas that come in from elsewhere. Um, So they haven't gone away. Facebook hasn't done nearly enough to try to clamp down on that. Sometimes they'll put a disclaimer. Sometimes they'll say, hey, this group you want to join talks about vaccines. You might want to be careful, but they haven't, you know, they haven't eliminated them by any stretch of the imagination. They're still there. At the same time, almost all of those groups now have contingency plans for when they get kicked off, right? Everybody who now joins knows if the day comes where we get kicked off, go to Parler, go to Gab, go to MeWe, go to wherever else they've already decided that they're going to use. Um, So, They've got ways to get around that and try to figure out how they're going to, you know, circumvent any kind of restrictions. But right now, they they haven't run into that many of them outside of those really militant groups like like People's Rights who got kicked off and moved to Telegram and their own system. Right. They've gone old school and they now have a system where they communicate with their 22,000 members around the country using text messages. Right. They'll text message to get people to show up at an event, uh, you know, show up at a protest, to, you know, show up at somebody's house. Uh, and that's been effective for them. And it's a more rapid way to get people involved. So they're constantly adapting and evolving those kind of things. And, you know, going back to those early days when we talked when we talked back in April, one of the groups, one of the individuals that was really pumping up the covid uh, insurrection stuff, the kind of anti-lockdown stuff, was Mark Meckler, who used to run Tea Party Patriots, right? And he runs a group, uh, a group called Convention of the States, which wants to rewrite the U.S. Constitution. Um, interestingly enough, after he pumped this all up back in in April and May, you know, he continued to do kind of anti-lockdown activities. You know what position he has now? What's that? He's the interim CEO at Parler. Ah, yeah, he took over at Parler. He is now in charge of running that operation now that they've come back online. Hmm. So I'm assuming that uh, Parler is going to be a platform to watch as these vaccinations roll out more broadly. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. It's a place where more and more of the kind of anti-lockdown meets anti-vaxxer activity is taking place. You know that's that, that's incredible. I actually missed that. I knew that uh, what's his face, the the founder of Parler, stepped down as CEO, but I missed who his. Well, he didn't really step down. He was pushed out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he, uh, you know, I, I did not see who replaced him though. That that really is something. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was one of those things that kind of blew my mind that you know he would step into that position. I think it's in part because he's been tight with Rebecca Mercer over the years and given her. Huge financial support for Parler. It was a, you know, it was kind of an automatic move of somebody she trusted into that position. So right. we'll see what goes from here. Right. Now you 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 keep actually mentioning uh, going. I feel like every time we 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 start discussing something new in this in this uh, mm-hmm. topic, you keep uh, mentioning people's rights. Now, do you think that is going to be the standout movement from all this? Like, do you think they're the ones who? Because a lot of those. A lot of those big lockdown protests, like obviously these people are still out there and talking and like communicating and they're part of the broader right movement. But like the idea of those movements being like a group of their own, I feel like they mostly have dissipated in terms of like acting as a cohesive unit. Like I don't really see them as organizing together as much as I did, you know, when when we were talking about them in April and even during like May and June and over the summer, I feel like they've sort of went their own separate ways still in the move, the broader movement, but you know, you know what I'm saying in terms of, but, but people's rights seems to be still uh, chugging away and, and, and getting ready to, to, to do whatever is next on their agenda. Yeah. They've continued to grow and expand, you know, ever since we did that report back in October, we know that their activities have continued to ramp up. Uh, 
um, you know, engaging in more of these state level confrontations, uh, moving into, you know, kind of local r- rural areas where there's not a lot of uh, opposition and trying to support local businesses and during the lockdowns and gain additional traction. And interestingly, Ammon Bundy himself is currently on a, a tour of Utah where he's starting to pivot the organization a little bit to expand their reach to bring back in to that movement kind of issues around uh, federal lands, grazing rights, and you know, and, and you know, and those kind of things. He's going back to his roots in essence to try to rebuild out that larger constituency under this one umbrella. Um, that's done such a great job of bringing in the militia types, the you know the proud boys, white nationalist types, all of them under one roof roof, and bring in a lot of anti-maskers, a lot of anti-vaxxers. And for the first time, it's a far right group that has a much larger appeal to women than we've ever seen before. So, you know, you know, back in the, you know, if you look back, most militia organizations are 80, 20 men versus women in terms of their, the number of people who are organized. The highest the far right's really gotten was with the Tea Party, and that was about 63 um, to 38%, somewhere around there, in terms of the overall membership. I know mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. over 100, but yeah, my math is not so good. But, I know what you're saying. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> but, you know, but for people's rights, at least at their, you know, certainly at their leadership level, it's now over 50% women. And mm-hmm. they have nearly a majority who are members at, who are women as well. So that is a pretty fundamental change for the organizing model for these groups. And that largely comes from giving a home to the anti-vaxxers and from pushing so much of the anti-lockdown stuff around uh, homes and schools and things like that, really appealing right. to women at a different level than far rightists have done before. So that's a big change and something we got to figure out new ways to grapple with, um, you know, moving forward. Right, right. Do you think there's an overlap? I mean, there there is, but how much is the overlap, I should say, uh, with uh, an organization like People's Rights and this, this uh, more, uh, I guess you can say, female-friendly uh, far right movement with QAnon, I mean, QAnon doesn't have a membership like, you know, like sort of like people's rights seems to have. But people who identify as QAnon uh, supporters definitely, I mean, I don't know if it's a majority, but it's definitely at least, I would say, 50-50 men, women. Like, there's a lot of women who support yeah. QAnon conspiracies. I mean, they're, that's sort of how, you know, these the, the lockdowns and the COVID <laughs> pandemic really is how QAnon was able to take hold with a much larger percentage of, of people. I mean, there's people out there who believe this stuff and don't even realize they believe in a pro Trump far right movement. It's in, you know, it's crazy. Um, you know, no, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, when we looked at the data back in October for people's rights, about a third of the, the members were into QAnon at some level. Right. And of that third, more than half, again, were women. So yes, that is a, one, another one of those ways in which they've used those different kinds of conspiracies to appeal to different demographics. And that's something, you know, that's, I think, a challenge. You know, I, the other thing that we haven't really talked about, but I think is important in the larger historical understanding of the kind of anti-lockdown protests and as they emerged is the other thing that happened along the way, you know, particularly in during the summer after George Floyd was killed, is you saw so many of those groups pivot to taking on uh, opposition to Black Lives Matter, right? They, they did this pretty almost instantaneous switch to being oppositional to those groups, to helping form counter demonstrations, to push anti-Black Lives Matter propaganda, to push those all the scurrilous lies about George Floyd, you know, all that kind of stuff was coming fast and furious out of this anti-lockdown world on Facebook. Uh, and so that's another part of that story. After that, you know, the, they started pivoting towards the election. And after the election, they made another pivot pretty substantially, overwhelmingly, in fact, towards promoting the stop the steal efforts. Right. You know, the kind of, you know, the efforts to lay the foundation for what would become the January 6th insurrection. 
Right. Yeah. They're, they're, you know, was the people was people how involved was people's rights with uh i'm sure they were people's rights uh, movement people who were there at the capitol there were we haven't found any yet who have been arrested but we know that there were that that there were definitely people's rights activists involved and there were a lot of folks who have been arrested so far who have had some level of involvement in the kind of different anti-lockdown groups on Facebook, um, as well as uh, obviously other far right groups like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. Right. Now, you know, I keep I keep thinking about what you know how we've got here to this point where uh, conspiracy theories are are just like a part of everyday. Uh, the everyday discourse, and it's not just like political conspiracies, like oh, you know, Trump, uh, you know, the big lie. And we're not just talking about the, the ele- uh, integrity of the election. We're talking people just not accepting the the realities of a pandemic. It's just yeah, so so insane. And how the right has been able to take advantage of all this is just. Man, I mean, it's it's going to be bad in these next few months for sure. I, I just can't, you know, wrap my head around it quite yet. Just the how how large it's going to be, but it's it's going to be an enormous amount of anti-vaccination uh, bullshit, and you're going to see a lot of people who don't consider themselves to be right wingers, who probably even have uh, left leaning politics out there, uh, just saying all yeah. this ridiculous, ridiculous regurgitating is the word i'm looking for all this ridiculous crap that they hear online from these uh right-wing anti-vaxxer conspiracy theorists oh yeah it's going to be it is going to be a challenge to try to stave off all that stuff and from its sinking roots i think is going to be a task of the of the highest order moving forward it's one of those things where it's so easy for it to perpetuate those lies and to Um, manifest them in so many different aspects, right? Uh, You know, you could package the same lie in a hundred different ways and, and, you know, inject it into so many different uh, areas online and make it, you know, make it grab hold so quickly. You know, I know in talking with folks who work around helping to um, distribute the vaccines and dealing with the issue of vaccine hesitancy, you know, going into this year, there was a lot of concern about communities of color having, a re, you know, right. pretty rapid uh, or negative reaction and potentially having some level of vaccine hesitancy there. I think largely because of the way the Biden administration has focused on the issue of equity and because they've done a lot of work in getting the message out to communities of color, those numbers have dropped pretty substantially in terms of overall hesitancy within communities of color. It's those, you know, it's in the Republican base now, that kind of MAGA world that where I think the challenges are going to be for the time being, at least according to some of that more recent polling data we've been looking at. Right. And I think it's I think it's important to differentiate. uh, But I do think there is a thin line where where a lot of, you know, anti-vaxxers and conspiracy theorists take advantage and, and, and pull those people in. But there's certainly a distinction between people who are cautious about brand new vaccines that rolled out in a matter of a year and then people who just full on believe, you know, hysteria and bullshit about them. I mean, yeah. I, we, we, I had a, a caller, I think it was last episode or two episodes ago who said she was not going to get the vaccine because she's pregnant. And I think that's like a legit concern. I mean, how many tests have they done with people who are pregnant? In fact, many doctors tell pregnant women to not do very many things that are completely safe for everybody else. Um, So I I get that concern. Uh, Oh, yeah. But then, you know, you know, anti-vaxxers and conspiracy theorists are going to take that concern and run with it and convince people that they're, you know, the vaccine's going to do something horrible to everybody, including their children. You know, it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you start getting into the the area of, you know, that George Soros and Bill Gates have conspired to put 5G chips into your arm to be able to track your every movement, you know, I think we've lost the thread. Uh, and it's, it's really hard to come back from that kind of nuttiness. Uh, but that's where we're at. Right. That's right. the kind of that's the kind of stuff that is being promoted. And there's new stuff 
developing every day. Um, and they're, you know, and they're working to try to reach new constituencies, whether it be anti-vaxxers trying to reach, you know, kind of yoga influencers or, you know, reaching out to, um, you know, communities of young moms on Facebook. There are all kinds of attempts to infiltrate various communities, take advantage of their willingness to have people help and deal with these questions um, but answer, you know, but fill their heads with all these lies and this disinformation to make it harder to move forward on getting people vaccinated. And that really troubles me. Right. Same. Uh, so let's do a slight pivot here and talk about something else that's happened over the past couple of weeks. Um, this is not the first time you've been on this show. We already discussed that was in April, discussed the lockdown protests. This is not the second time you've been on this show because the second time was in October of last year when you came on to break down the Groiper movement for all of us. Now you're back on this show and you're talking about things you covered in both of those previous appearances because the Groipers are back in the news because... Uh, you know, CPAC decided to get a little uh, pandemic get together going. Didn't matter that we're we're still in the you know there's still a pandemic. They decided to do CPAC in Florida this year, uh, and uh, CPAC happened about what was it? Uh, two weeks ago, I would say about yeah. around. Yep, two weeks ago. And you know, the big takeaway from that was basically uh, a uh, anti-vaxxers and conspiracy theorists who do like Trump. We're very disappointed in him because he was promoting the vaccine. Because after all, he got it himself. Right. And another thing was that whole big uh, discussion about the CPAC stage, which I don't want to get into again. Because, no, no, no. Yeah, you yeah. covered that well enough, I think. Yeah. Right. And if anyone wants to catch that episode last week with uh, Mike Rains of the Adventures in Hellworld podcast. That was but, great, but... Oh, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to let, uh, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of great reviews about that one and a lot of great words for uh, Mike. I got to let him know. Yeah. Um, and you know, the fact that you two could talk wrestling like that was fantastic. So. <laughs> and you know what? The interesting thing was I let, uh, he, I think he dropped all the references uh, that episode. That was a first oh, yeah. on this show. No, no he, he was seamless at it. It was great. Yeah. A sh uh, uh, episode of this show where I wasn't the one dropping the wrestling references. I'm, I was surprised. <laughs> uh, but, there was another right wing uh, uh, conference going on that same weekend in Florida, and it was the Groipers conference. What's it called again? The uh, uh, America AFPAC. First. What's the it called? America First Political Action Conference. AFPAC. AFPAC. And, you know, it sounds a lot like AFLAC, but right. Just the America First Political Action Conference. Right, so. and for people who aren't aware, I feel like I feel like he's done a bad job at at uh, branding AFPAC and Groipers because I feel like his name yeah. is still the one most people know of, uh, and you know that's not the case with say like Richard Spencer and the alt right. I would say more people are familiar with the term alt right than than Spencer, but more people seem to be familiar with Nick Fuentes. Then yep. the the name Groipers and uh, you know this is Fuentes's thing, uh, and you know he put this thing together and I was explaining it earlier on the majority part when I was uh, uh, promoting this episode to uh, the audience on that show earlier today, and I basically was like you know uh, you know CPAC uh, it was a you could consider it a white nationalist conference but it's not like they're not openly branding themselves that. Like AFPAC does. That's the difference. That's how you can pretty much like parse the difference between the two. These are yeah. like the true explicit versus explicit. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's even that's 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 a good one right there. I like that. <laughs> uh, so why don't you, uh, Devin, break down what happened at AFPAC? Because I know you and your organization has really been on top of the Groiper movement, and you 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 covered the uh, what what went down at AFPAC. Yeah, it was a, I think it's an important event for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, AFPAC itself um, is a second uh, conference like this that they've held. They held one about this time last year. Um, that one had about 150 to 175 people. This one had five to 600 people at it. So they've grown uh, substantially in, in a very short time. And what they've done is they've attempted to repackage and rebrand white nationalism for Zoomers in a way that makes it more palatable to the mainstream. 
So they've adopted the kind of Trumpian rhetoric around America first. They've tried to use language around immigration and demographics to try to appeal to this larger constituency. They've reached out to lots of younger people using uh, various online gaming streaming services, you know, starting with YouTube, then DLive, now uh, Trovo and some other services where they keep getting kicked off of. Um, so they've developed this following of tens of thousands of, you know, uh, of Zoomers who are interested in the the kind of melding of white nationalism with pretty hardcore misogyny um, into what they're, they've dubbed the Groiper movement, which is an effort to um, essentially move the Overton window of the Republican Party in the white nationalist direction, right? They want to attack groups like Turning Point USA and um, Young Americans for Freedom and really start to force them to um, either become more openly white nationalist around issues like immigration and other issues around race or get crushed. That's their goal. And they're waging that, you know, they're waging that war on college campuses, uh, online and everywhere else they can find a foothold. And in doing so, what they've done is they've also created a following within some Republican circles. So the big thing that happened at this year's event that really made it stand, stand out from any of the other white nationalist events we've covered for a really long time was that they had a sing sitting congressman speak at their event, as well as a former congressperson, share the stage with them. So you had Arizona Representative Paul Gosar speak at the perform you know, at the at the event and give the lamest performance of anyone at the event. Um, creepy lighting aside, his performance was dulled by a message that was largely regurgitation around wanting to protect free speech and trying to uh, appeal to that younger generation to to and to speak the language of America first. So in essence, by him being there, he gave them the credibility and the standing that they they have so long desired inside Republican circles and really helped um, move them a step closer to the mainstream. You know, you also had uh, Representative Steve King speaking there, you know, the guy who lost all his committee seats because he said, what's wrong with being called a white nationalist? Um, former you know, representative, I should add. Yeah, former representative. Yeah, who's now out of Congress. Um, you know, he was a representative from Iowa, but he also helped give some status to that event. Uh, you know, those are big things to have a former and a sitting congressperson speak at, at your event. Um, and in addition to that, you had a few people of color speak at the event to largely promote the same kind of messages and to try to, you know, deflect the charges about racism in the group. You had Michelle Malkin, you know, the who calls herself the Groiper Mommy. Um, who has uh, a long-standing tradition of extreme nativism and Islamophobia? You know, she's written a book called "Defense of Internment" about right. the you know Japanese internment. So that's how far out she is. Uh, she writes for the white nationalist publication Vidare, but she is one of those folks who have tried to help you know in this rebranding effort, and she did very much along those same lines on the stage at AFPAC. And then you had um, you had uh, John Miller, a, a writer for The Blaze there, African-American guy who got up and essentially repeated some of the same mantras about, you know, the, um, you know, the attack on, you know, on America first and the necessity for doing that. In essence, again, trying to, to deflect some of the charges of racism from the group, even though he's making essentially the same arguments. And then you had folks like... Um, you had folks like Vincent James, a groiper from California, get up and talk about how they're going to try to um, start running primary candidates against the Republicans in 2022 to create a real far right reactionary insurgency, in his words. And Nick Fuentes got up there and talked about the, you know, the basic racial composition of the United States being a white nation and said that America is also a Christian nation. So try, try to both extend his efforts to promote white nationalism, but also to try to bring in some of the Christian nationalism as well. And interestingly, 
after playing such a role in so, so many of the stop the steal efforts that led up to January 6th, Fuentes has also begun starting to parrot a lot of the QAnon rhetoric around the deep state and those kind of conspiracies. So he's also trying to appeal to that demographic to try to reach out to those folks as well, to try to bring them in under the Groiper umbrella, you know, despite how goofy the name is, you know, he's trying to retake the mantle of America first in the white nationalist, the explicitly white nationalist direction. Are, are, is, he, is he still really? Because I, I honestly haven't seen them really use Groiper. So they are they still going by that even? They're not so much. You know, they you know he, he's now really bought into the whole America First brand. So they're sticking to that. They still will talk about the Groiper Wars and how he's a Groiper general, and they still give out little Groiper stickers at the conference. But they're you know, but they're largely moving on beyond that. They're trying to you know again, recast themselves. It's a constant, you know, influencer, influencer rebranding effort that goes on with Fuentes and his compadres. I'm imagining, I'm imagining, like, like you said, like a, a QAnon believer with everything that they, they, uh, they follow, uh, saying to themselves, I don't know about this griper thing. That sounds funny. I mean, <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, true. yeah, good point. You know, Fu Fuentes really is it really just the platforms they're on? Like, I, I don't. It, it honestly has been a little bit surprising to me how successful Fuentes has been at becoming such a big figure to the the future. I guess you can say of the far white right and and white nationalist groups. You know, there's been a lot of personalities who've come and gone. A lot of personalities who've still been you know, uh, hacking away at it. But Fuentes has been surprisingly successful when compared to some other people, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. I think his success is far greater than we ever anticipated. I think it's because he has that ability to constantly shapeshift his message to appeal to whatever audience he's in front of. Uh, he's got, uh, you know, solid speaking skill. He's got that sense of irony and... Um, you know, and that comedic, somewhat comedic timing that makes him unique for that crowd. And he's also, you know, climbed up on the backs of a lot of white nationalists uh, to get to where he's at. You know, he wouldn't be where he was without the kind of organizational um, support that he got from people like Patrick Casey, who ran the American Identity Movement, which before that was known as Identity Europa. Um, you know, they've since split largely over the, the decision to hold this conference. Um, but they, you know, what, what but, was the but, disagreement on that? It, it was a pretty public, ugly dispute. Um, Fuentes was going to go ahead with it no matter what Casey said, look, it's too soon after the January 6th stuff. We need to lay low. You're worried about the optics. They're worried about the, the potential for, um, doxing and worried about, um, the potential for, you know, conflict at the event. So we should hold off. Fuentes went ahead and said no, and then totally threw Casey under the bus and started, you know, in a long uh, interview on one of the on one of the streaming programs. I think it was on Killstream went on and on about all the bad things that Casey's done in terms of being, you know, not an effective leader and unable to organize. And, oh, he didn't get the banners for the last conference and on and on and on. Um Despite all that, you know, I think Fuentes decided that he'd gotten all that he could out of Casey and was moving ahead. And he's now got uh, bigger sights in mind. You know, he's really looking at trying to capture the, you know, the hearts and minds of young, you know, young Republicans and move them in that direction. Uh, so one of the things that in addition to these two Congress people uh, that was noteworthy about AFPAC, Another notable attendee, which we just uh, this evening released a new piece on, uh, was an attendee um, called uh, Matt Brainerd. Matt Brainerd was one of the original data guys on the Trump 2016 uh, campaign, uh, has done a lot of data work as well as a lot of work around voter integrity, you know, trying to clean, clean up voter rolls and, you know, make it harder for people to participate in the democratic process. Um, Brainerd was not only in attendance at the at AFPAC 2, 
but he was also a vendor there and looking to gain new clients, right? He had a prominent exhibition at the event and was using it as a way to kind of merge his efforts around, um, you know, voter turnout and voter suppression with the Groiper efforts to move forward and start running candidates. So we fully anticipate in 2022 to see at least a handful of Groiper style candidates running for office, trying to move the Overton window around the party even further in the white nationalist direction, um, particularly around issues about immigration and COVID. Um, and so, yeah, so I think we're going to see some more young candidates stepping up, running for office, getting experience. And now they've got some people with some technical skills like Brainerd on board to run this. And Fuentes is also sitting on a ton of cash. He recently got a, a massive do a Bitcoin donation from a French programmer who later committed suicide. You know, I think he got the, the equivalent of right now around half a million dollars in Bitcoin donated to him from this, from this programmer. Um, and that's helping him fund a lot of these efforts. He's also raising money on his various platforms. Um, and well, he's only accepting well, cryptocurrency now, but Oh, go ahead. Oh, hold on. There's, there's a lot here. Hold on. I, yeah. you know, I, I might even have to cut this up into two separate podcast episodes: the the COVID first half and this Groiper yeah. half. Because I wasn't expecting uh, these sort of revelations. What <laughs> I missed this. A, I, I honestly, what you just said: if this was to happen to anybody outside the right. The right would be talking about some big, like, Epstein didn't kill himself level conspiracy theory uh, in terms of uh, someone receiving a massive donation from someone who then goes ahead and commits suicide shortly after. Who, yeah. who who is this who is this programmer this this you know he he's an i forget his name now but he's a you know i think um there are a few different pieces on it that go into kind of his background he was a you know kind of disaffected french programmer a young guy who was kind of uh loosely affiliated with the kind of incel movement there in france uh, was also attracted to white nationalists so before committing suicide, he gave a massive donation to uh, to Fuentes, who got the largest chunk, but also to Patrick Casey, to VDARE, and a few other white nationalist organizations. He kind of parceled out all this Bitcoin that he collected over the years um, to these folks. And with Bitcoin shooting up the way it is, uh, it actually turns out to be a massive windfall for them. All right. I'm looking this up now. I, I, I must have missed this during the whole—because it was a couple of days after— I think it happened right after the election, so it was right in that period where there was already so much going on. The, the news broke right after the uh, the insurrection, so it was probably oh, completely yeah. steamrolled by all that news, right? Yeah. yeah in yeah. this in December 2020, a French computer programmer named Laurent. Hold on, it's getting cut off by the uh, Google. Uh, uh, Laurent Bachelor. That's it. Yeah. Donated. More than half a million dollars in Bitcoin. Jeez. Yeah. Wow. What, what a mysterious French blogger the Daily Mail called him. Uh, I guess not much is known about this guy. He went by the name Pen Pen Pencaki. <laughs> Clever name, I guess. Uh <laughs> A combination of pancake and, uh, you know, uh, yeah. let's, uh, uh, I, I, uh, you know, man, big money in being a right winger. God. Yeah. Oh yeah. The grift is strong with these guys, man. What I wouldn't give for a half a million in Bitcoin. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, you know, and this is on top of the, you know, the nearly $80,000 a year that Fuentes is bringing down in his streaming. You know, while he was on D-Lab, he was making about 80K a year. Right. I, I, I'm thinking about it now, and I think I remember, because in December, I had someone on this show to talk about how how um, uh, the right was using, uh, like, encrypted platforms and the blockchain, and we discussed on it how cryptocurrency was, was big fundraising efforts for them. And I think I remember vaguely now 
the big donation being in the news, but I completely missed, and you know, the big donation isn't so, to these right-wing groups isn't so much a, a, a shocker, but I, I completely missed the story about this guy having um, been this like mysterious benefactor who committed suicide shortly after. What a weird... I, I got to look more into that. I wonder, if, has it come out? Is there any note left behind? Why, what, what happened with this guy? I haven't, I haven't seen anything more on it. Um, my understanding is that this is, was also one of the reasons why there was some friction between Casey and Fuentes. Um, not just because of that Fuentes got a lot more than Casey did, but also because um, as a result of this, Casey went on Killstream and started talking about how... Um, this was uh, this put uh, Fuentes under FBI investigation, so he was worried about the feds swooping in. Um, so, uh, you know, Casey went on to say that oh, Fuentes' bank accounts have been frozen and that the feds are coming to get him. Um, none of which is necessarily true, although I do, you know, I, I imagine that there are some curious people wondering like you about that that big donation. Um, you know, they haven't de determined whether or not, you know, they're going to move forward on it, but I think they're looking at him. But that certainly scared Casey away from wanting to go ahead and start flouting all that at a conference in Orlando at the same time as CPAC. Right. Now, how much do you think, you know, uh, uh, to me, I, I think Fuentes' best move for his whole, uh, the reason he's been able to stand out, uh, compared to everyone else right now in that world is that live stream show he does. Um, it's so different than the rest of those guys. Like, you know, uh, all, all those right wingers who, who got big over the past, you know, half a decade or, or even more, like a lot of these guys started, you know, making a name for themselves in like, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, you know, a lot of them were doing like live streaming, but it was like these long, like, like discussions with like four different people having these big, like philosophical debates for hours and hours. Like who's going to watch a five hour long uh, stream with like Sargon of Akkad debating with someone else on the right about what the best <laughs> move forward is, is for people who don't think that. You know, uh, you know, who are fighting the white genocide, you know, all this ridiculous stuff that they would talk about for hours and hours. Whereas Fuentes yeah. has like a more like modern, like talk show type thing where he like interacts with the audience. He's not getting into like these long, uh, drawn out like uh, debates with other people in his live stream that goes on for hours. He's like sort of doing what a lot of like left wing streamers do or what like Twitch streamers do with their audience. It's like uh he he like sort of took what he saw was working outside of right wing politics and and brought it to the right wing uh media landscape. That's just my estimation of, of everything. You are absolutely right. And it's you know, I have to make a confession now. Nick Fuentes and I share something in common. we we were both in high school debate nerds. Um, so he learned a lot of those techniques while, while he was in high school, you know, from high school speech and debate programs and from working on the local high school television program. So he's kind of been in that milieu for a long time. Um, so he's had time to kind of perfect his craft and work on his delivery and his presentation and all that kind of stuff. Um, at the same time, he's moved so much further in the white nationalist direction over just a short time, you know, over like four or five years, um, that it is quite remarkable. And he's someone who early on, you know, even when he was just, while he was still at, you know, just at university, he was carving out a name for himself by speaking at things like the social contract press writers group, which is a big native influential nativist gathering of influential nativist writers um, as well as, you know, getting a hold in some campaign circles. And interestingly enough, he started out as a supporter of Ted Cruz. And now he's moved, you know, he's, he has certainly changed his opinion on that dramatically as he's become more of a proponent of openly fascist ideas and the kind of, you know, notions about, you know, white, white uh, dispossession and 
the position of white folks in the country. So his transformation in a very short time is one, because he has those skills that we're going to pay close attention to. I was talking to our founder, Lenny Zeskin, the other day, and he was talking about how Fuentes, in some ways, reminds him of a combination of a young David Duke combined with the kind of snarkiness and attitude of a young Lincoln Rockwell. Um, so that in and of itself is kind of a terrifying mix of, of figures. Um, so it, he's definitely one to keep watch on, but he's just one of a whole constellation of these figures that they brought under the Groper umbrella and are now, they are literally preparing to start running for candidates, running candidates for office in 2022. And I don't think that um, many people are prepared for that yet. Um, I remember back when Duke ran for office the first time, uh, and there were not a lot of folks who were prepared for that. And as a result, he ended up winning a seat in the Louisiana, Louisiana State Legislature, at which time he was selling Mein Kampf out of his legislative office. So do I think that this is going to be problematic? I do. I think it's going to be one of the things we got to watch moving forward. Right. And, you know, I, to, to speak to that, too, I think there's going to be a whole you know range of issues with with those type of guys running. Uh, if you think, you know, take what happened with uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene when she ran for office, uh, her opponent, her Democratic opponent dropped out and he said he was getting harassed and, and receiving and threats from her supporters her her QAnon supporters. And he had to drop out. He just he just couldn't deal with it. Yeah. And, you know, you could imagine this happening across the country, maybe not in every one of their races, but at least a few where you have these Fuentes following groipers running for office and a, uh, you know, a, a Democratic challenger who's unprepared for the moment and just having to drop out and, and th throw in the towel after receiving harassment from other, you know, people who love Fuentes. I mean... Uh, you know, combine that with uh, I was reading the other day how the um, the the woman who stormed the Capitol on January 6th and was arrested, the one who allegedly stole Nancy Pelosi's laptop, she apparently was a or is, excuse me, is a huge, huge fan. Nick yep. Fuentes fan. Huge. Like, I don't just mean like she follows his, uh, you know, his show or whatever. I mean, from what I've read and the screenshots and stuff I've seen or, and the discussions in the interviews with her, people who knew her or know her, uh, she is in love with him. Like, she thinks he yeah. is uh, the greatest thing ever. Like, like how you, you know your parents reacted to the Beatles coming to America. That's how she Your views Nick Fuentes. Far too small a word to capture how much she liked him. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. she got she got a photo with him or something. And like, uh, you know, drew hearts around it and told all of her friends that she was like melting from it or something like, you know, she was in love with it. It's just, you know, it's it's creepy. It's it's scary oh, stuff. Yeah. 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 I mean, he's got that kind of, you know, he's got that kind of charisma and that ability to um, reach that kind of audience. And he's also got a plan. Right. They started by using the fights around TPUSA and Young Americas for Freedom to start taking over college Republican chapters, right? And which they've done at dozens of campuses around the country. They're using that as a, pla as a platform to now start moving candidates out. And they're, you know, they're thinking ab about the next steps about moving this stuff forward. Now that they've seen an opportunity under the Trump regime, they think that they have the ability to start kind of recrafting and molding the America first message to keep that um, base moving in their direction for the long term. Right. Now, and that, yeah. yeah, that's really worrisome. Now, when, when you came on last year to talk about the Groypers, as you had mentioned how, you know, and early how, in the how, year they had this whole big strategy of basically like flooding the college campuses with their, their, you know, themselves and their propaganda uh, but but you'd also mentioned how, you know, the pandemic sort of railroaded those plans and they had to, you know, they, they couldn't do it anymore. There was no one on the campuses for the bulk of last year. W were they able to to I mean, obviously, Nick Fuentes, Nick Fuentes, live stream probably was a huge 
uh, uh, replacement strategy for them in terms of, uh, you know, swapping out the college campus strategy with the Nick Fuente show strategy. But was there anything else they they they, they moved to so they could st- so they were still able to stay relevant? Streaming was the big thing for them, right? So it was not only Fuentes, but you had folks like Jaden McNeil, Patrick Casey, uh, you know, a whole core of them not only had their own shows, they also did a lot of video game streaming together. You know, these would be those hours long uh, video game chats while they were, you know, playing Fortnite or whatever else. Um, And they would bring in folks like Baked Alaska and a whole bunch of other folks uh, to kind of, you know, shoot the, you know, to sit around and gossip and talk about, you know, all kinds of racial, ethnic and gender stereotypes and um, just try to be cool. And um, and it worked for them. I think they they carved out a niche for themselves uh, amongst the, that, that streamer world. Um, you know, amongst the folks who lean to the right, they became personalities and celebrities um, and influencers, and they were successful at using that primarily. They've tried other venues, right? And they keep getting kicked off of them, but they've done so in a way that they use the act of getting kicked off to gain more publicity, right? So Fuentes went on, you know, showed up on TikTok and did so in such a way you know, that he knew he was going to get kicked off. In fact, he invaded the the TikTok board meeting as a way to kind of make his presence known and then get kicked off on the platform. Just last week, he showed up on Clubhouse, you know, for just a brief period of time. I think he lasted on there for three hours, but again, used it to use the publicity to say, oh, I'm such a controversial figure. Look at me. They're banning me from even Clubhouse. What do I, you know, what am I saying that is so controversial that you want to hear? Right. It is really using that old strategy of rebellion uh, and fighting against the system uh, to try to make them uh, make a name for themselves. Right. (sighs) You know, it's 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 I'm actually, you know, I I I underestimated Fuentes, to be honest, you know, back when, you know, all the names were, were coming out in 2015, 2016. These are the the major personalities who are carving their place in the Trump, the Trump world, you know, the, the Trump cinematic universe, you know, Fuentes was one of those guys who I thought, you know, he'll, 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 he'll have his moments, but he's not going to be one of the standouts. He's not going to be someone who like is standing atop the mountain because still there's going to be other guys who, who are more successful at doing that. And, you know, as some of these guys are falling out of the spotlight or dwindling away into uh, irrelevancy, Fuentes is one of the few still standing uh, strong. It's it's quite it's quite surprising, honestly. Oh yeah, I mean, and he's been able to avoid the you know the stigma of being around so many of these massively controversial events. Right, he was at Charlottesville, and that hasn't really stuck to him. He was a massive participant in the stop the steal efforts and was organizing, you know, a kind of his own rump rally at uh, the Capitol on January 6th. While he didn't go inside the Capitol uh, when they breached the, the, the doors and the windows, uh, some of his supporters did. And there have been at least now a couple of them who have been arrested. You know, it was, his America first flag that flew throughout in the Capitol halls and on the floor of the Senate. Um, one of the guys from the guy from UCLA who was arrested uh, was a well-known groper and a big, another big fan of Fuentes. All right. Uh, well, I guess, uh, Devin, I'll be having you back on this show when, uh, when there's a whole uh, a whole lineup of groipers running for for office. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully you can have me on to talk. To, you know, some about something more interesting. We can talk music or something. Right? Be, yeah, yeah, could, yeah, something. <laughs> right. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today, Devin. You know, between the 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 COVID uh, update of where these mask anti maskers and anti lockdown people are at. And how the right is still weaponizing uh, them, even when they don't know they're on the right. And the Groiper conference that uh, seems to be the kickoff of something much bigger for Nick Fuentes in the coming years. 
uh, you, you, uh, a beacon of uh, good news and hope in a <laughs> in a in a, in a well, world that's <laughs> becoming more difficult to live in every day. Uh, yeah, let's uh, yeah, uh, let's do it again sometime. No, but for real. <laughs> Uh, always a pleasure when you you come on this show, Devin. Um, Devin Berghardt, everyone, executive director of the uh, Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights. Where can people find your work and follow you? You know, they can find me at our website, which is irehr.org, or follow me on Twitter at dberghart. That's D B U R G H A R T. And I hope, you know, if any of your listeners out there are interested in learning to do the kind of work that we do, uh, hit me up. We're about to do another series of research trainings to kind of walk people through how we do what we do uh, and to get more folks engaged in it because there's way too much activity going on for any one organization. The more folks we've got out there who have skills to track this kind of stuff, the better. Right. Yeah. yeah. Especially since all, all these uh, figures got deplatformed and now instead of just knowing at least like you know we can follow for the most part the the main you know thread lines on like facebook and twitter and and youtube now there's literally like 20 to 30 different platforms and still more coming and growing every few weeks it's it seems good. like oh, yeah yeah it's interesting you know it's good that there's a platform so they're not get, you know spreading this stuff to uh the broader public but it's made it's uh, the life of the people who track the, these guys uh, exponentially harder, to be honest. <laughs> Take the trade off any day. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Thanks a lot, Devin. Have a great night. Thanks, Matt. All right, everybody. We will go now to the second half of the show. Uh, I, I think I'm going to split that up. Uh, I think... I don't want that Groiper part, the, the Groiper discussion to get, you know, lost after that, that COVID discussion because they were both, you know, I've had, obviously I've had uh, people on the show before who we've done two topics, but usually there was like a main topic and then like a quick update or news, you know, a 10, 15 minute long update on the second topic. This was like two separate podcasts in one. I got to cut it in half so no one misses that Groiper stuff because that COVID, you know, the the COVID update could be... Uh, uh, something on its own that people might be, you know, throwing the towel and not want to keep going once they hit the griper stuff. So I got, I think I'm gonna split that up for the podcast. Um, but anyway, folks, uh, to support this show, go to Patreon.com/slash Matt Binder and subscribe. Uh, big news, and I'm very proud to say this. Uh, after our show last week. When I called for patron subscribers and I explained how, you know, we almost broke uh, a big 200 patrons last month, but we fell short by like one or two. And then the first of the month hit and some people had their cards decline, which happens. Uh, it actually looks like everyone fixed their card. So it looks like it was just like an issue where cards expired or got lost. Um, but we had just missed that 200 mark but then people heard the podcast and watched the live stream or watched the replay and we have finally surpassed 200 patrons i'm honestly uh very grateful and very proud of being able to do that again it might not seem like a big number for people who subscribe to much bigger shows bigger patron patreons but for this little program that's just me all me, one host, one producer, one person putting this all together. Uh, that's me, by the way, just in case you were wondering who that one person was. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, so uh, thank you, everyone. And it would be great to get to that next goal and to keep hitting these new milestones until one day this show is... Uh, self-sustaining, and I could do this show more often, uh, more in-depth, uh, possibly even expand to it not being just me. But that's not in the near future, uh, unless all of a sudden uh, the Patreon grew exponentially again. But uh, 
let me give myself one of these for uh, and all of you honestly all the patrons for supporting the show and all the listeners in general really this is for all the support you guys have given me And without any further ado, I'm going to thank, by name, all the patrons who subscribed to this show since the last episode. When was the last episode, by the way? Okay. All right. It was the the Trump's re-inauguration day episode, right? So here we go. Paul E. Peter L. Or... I should say low frequency. Peter Low Frequency. Gabriel R. Colleen W. Richard L. Greg V. Gregory C. Ooh, the Gregs. Cecily L. And Phil B. Thank you guys so much for joining this program on Patreon. Thank you for becoming patrons and pushing this show past the 200 mark. And obviously, I can't name all 200 of you, plus 200 plus of you, I should say right now. But thank you to all 200 plus patrons for supporting this show. Uh, it means uh, it means it means the world to me. Uh, subscribe to the show on YouTube, youtube.com slash Matt Binder. Absolutely free to do so. Uh this is interesting, actually. I, a little bit of a, a quick story here. Apple is changing the word subscribe on their podcast app to follow because studies show that the word subscribe makes people think of paid subscriptions so they don't sign up to listen to podcasts because they think subscribing to one on Apple Podcasts or Google Play or wherever means they have to pay for it. That is truly uh, very surprising to me. So uh, YouTube subscriptions are free. Subscribe on YouTube. Just click the subscribe button and you can follow the show on YouTube. Patreon subscriptions, not free. That costs money. Patreon.com slash MapVinder. Oh, I totally forgot. Someone wanted to actually, and you could turn paid subscriptions on on YouTube. And someone requested that. I guess they didn't want to join Patreon. I will turn that on. So you could subscribe on YouTube too. I will do that. Uh, ooh, we had a uh, a listener become a patron uh, subscriber right now during the show. You get a, a name drop too, my friend. Ryan, thank you for becoming a patron. Uh, you can get your name dropped on this show. Still time, patreon.com slash mattbinder. Follow me everywhere on social media, at Matt Binder on Twitter, at Matt Binder on Instagram. Search Matt Binder pretty much anywhere, and I'll pop up. Uh, what else? Uh, follow this show on Apple Podcasts slash iTunes, whatever Apple's calling it nowadays, or on Google Play, or on Stitcher, or on Spotify. I'm on all those platforms. Just search Doomed with Matt Binder. It'll pop up. If you'd like to go directly to the podcast website, doomedpod.com will take you to the audio version of this show. You can directly download the MP3 straight from the um, the site if you don't want to subscribe, if you don't want to follow, I should say, on any of those podcast platforms. Uh, tell your favorite YouTuber, podcaster, whoever about this show, and tell me who your favorite podcaster. Uh, YouTuber, whoever is, so uh, I can get them on this show. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is the uh, the first half of the show. First halves, I should say. Remember, this is going to be split up into two podcasts. Um, and it will not take away from any live shows. By the way, it's not like I'm gonna. It's not like I'm telling you guys. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut uh, this into two and then not do a show next week. No. That's not happening. I'm just giving uh, splitting this up because it's, it's that good. I don't want you guys to miss out on uh, on the, the 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 second topic we discussed with Devin. So, uh, folks, uh, that's it for this episode. Oh, 
Thank you, Socially Democrat, for the super chat. I almost forgot. Uh, if you're watching live, you can support this show with a one-off donation by dropping a super chat in the chat. You can drop a question, a comment, whatever you'd like. I will read them. I'm also going to open up the Skype uh, call-in line. Uh, just open up your Skype app and type in, type in Doomed Live. Uh, and we'll jump right into some calls if you'd like to call in. Other than that, I will see you all next time on Doomed. All right, we are back. We are back. Hooey. Oh, I forgot to log into the uh, Skype uh, call in line. Let me do that right now. Uh, again, you can just open up Skype. Uh, Skype is free. If you're doing a Skype to Skype call, which this is, so it won't cost you anything, just sign up for Skype, download the app to your computer or your phone. Uh, and uh, type in in the search bar doomed live and you can talk to me right now as I try to remember the path here we go okay uh, let's go to some super chat uh, comments and questions midnight pizza mon with a super chat I am the table no idea what that means Samantha Sider with a super chat. Lula Livre, congrats on hitting 200 patrons. Thank you very much, uh, Samantha. Oh, we got a call. Uh, hold on. Let me pull up your audio on Skype. Here we go. Uh, who is this? It's Zoe. Hey, Zoe. How are you doing today? I'm all right. Um, I just wanted to say uh, Laurent Bachelier. Oh, is that the name of the French programmer who donated all that money to uh, to Nick Fuentes and then uh, committed suicide? Yeah. I what? The, how did I pronounce it again? I don't remember. Laurent Bachelor. Laurent Bachelor. I like that better. What? What are you? What, how is it pronounced? Laurent Bachelier. Ah, Laurent Bachelier. Uh, Bachelier how, does mean bachelor, though. So. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'm actually very glad you called in, Zoe, because I don't know if <laughs> I'm sorry, Ryan. Ryan in the super chat just said, "Hell yeah, drag his ass, Zoe." <laughs> <laughs> right? You Thank can you, Ryan. You can drag me on my French pronunciation. Um, let me try again. What is it again? Laurent Bachelier. Laurent Bachelier. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> well, oh, I, I was I was very French there. I feel like Laurent. Uh, well, yeah, because uh, you Anglo English speakers don't know how to pronounce the R's in French. I think so I, I want to make sure. I think once you told me, I, I think I'm able to do it though. I just needed the guidance. Yeah, but that's I why think, I make it clear. I think I just pulled it off though, Laurent. Yeah, that's it. I just, I feel like I just need like a a cigarette in my hand. I need to look at the camera and go like Laurent. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, anyway, I'm very glad you called in, Zoe, because I don't know if you saw, but there was an update to something that you called in about a few weeks, maybe it was even a month or two ago, about the uh, the Epoch Times. Oh. Uh -huh. Now, you called in to tell me about these pamphlets and flyers that were uh, being passed around in Canada. Remember that? Yeah, the newspapers. C can you break down what that was again? Well, basically, on like a Tuesday, um, like around the midday, we received the, the Epoch Times physical newspaper in French. Uh, and like... Everyone in the province received one. 
and it was like this huge thing of like trying to spread their bullshit to everyone. Right. Right. And you had mentioned at the time, I think that you had, if I remember correctly, you had, uh, thought you, you had, uh, guessed from your experience with, uh, you know, with what you, what you know about how this all works, that there was funding enabling, uh, the epic, uh, epic times, epoch times to do this from the Canadian government. Yeah, there was something, because they used uh, Post Canada, which, like, it did, a, like, a controversy because some uh, Post uh, workers didn't want to, didn't want to give them out. Right. Now, I have an update for you. I don't know if you've seen this, but there was a story just a couple of days ago. Uh, where it came out that the Canadian government had given a grant of something like four hundred thousand plus dollars to Falun Gong, which is the uh, religious uh, organization that mm. runs the uh, Epoch Times. Oh yeah, I did not hear that actually. Though. So, yeah. I'm not that surprised because Trudeau's relationship with China and all that is uh, friendlier than the U.S.'s. Well, not really. Right. I don't know. I don't know exactly what's going on. Right. But, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there's some sort of religious grant or something like that for uh, different religious groups or who knows what the deal is but you know governments are always giving grant money to non-profit organizations and the like so um, I'm sure yeah. they were able to convince the Canadian government that this was for some good cause or, or something of that matter and then I'm going to dive deeper into it I got to do an episode on Falun Gong to begin with yeah. Uh, but yeah I just thought that was interesting that you had uh, mentioned that on this show and then I saw that story come out and it was just the, the perfect uh, uh, be perfect uh, crashing of worlds I guess you can say uh, Pranay in chat says it's an art grant there you go I guess the Epoch Times is a work of art right well no they have their dance uh, Shen Yu. oh right 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 that's what <laughs> I'm sure I, I wonder what though how much of those funds yeah, I'm sure. Who knows? The books were. I'm not gonna allege anything, but you know, other organizations have cooked the books and and uh, you know, put money here and there and 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 made things look like they were going somewhere when they were really being funneled elsewhere. Not saying that's what happened here, but actually, also, who knows? Maybe uh, you know, being that they got that grant money for uh, uh, Shang Yun, they were able to uh, take the uh, Shang Yun profits and put that towards uh, the Epic Times. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, they probably just share the money around all they want. Right. Uh, but thanks for the call, though. We appreciate it. Let me let me try one more time for you. Uh, let's see if I remember. Laurent. Yes. I'm not even gonna try the last one. That one's a bit harder. Bit bit. What was it? <laughs> Bichelieu. Bichelieu. What was it? Bachelieu. Bachelieu. Yeah. Bachelieu. <laughs> well. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad I'm entertaining you, at least. Th thanks for the call, <laughs> Zoe. Have a great night. Thank you. You too. Uh, let's go to the next caller here. Uh, let me let them know they could call back in. And while I wait, I will... Go oh, they're calling in right now. Here we go. Hey, uh, you are on the air. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Uh, this is Tony from Texas. My pronouns are she, they. Um, so happy to be talking with you, Matt. I'm a huge fan of your work. Um, I uh, got into uh, Doomed after you know seeing you on the Majority Report. Been watching the Majority Report for a while. Um, and Thursdays are usually one of my favorite days to watch. Um, bittersweet, I got a new job that has me like working in a way that I can't listen live um, Thursday, like 
Tuesdays through Thursdays right now, uh, but I'm like knocking on doors for um, a uh, grassroots organization in my area trying to get some uh, progressive uh, candidates on city council and in, in the mayoral seat for uh, a big city. Um, I'm not going to dox myself, but uh, here in Texas, we're glad for any opportunity to like take some ground for, for progressives. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to shout out and say how grateful I am for all the all the work that you do and like sp spreading like leftist news and stuff um <clears throat> samson acquired taste but uh <laughs> one of his best qualities is that he surrounds himself with really great people like you and lack and emma and the late great brother Bo brooks so um yeah Right. Like, uh, <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Tony from Texas, for calling into the show. Uh, then I want to thank you for the extremely kind words. Uh, and then I want to congratulate you on the job. Uh, and then an extra congratulations on uh, not only getting a, a, this, this new job, landing this new job, but it being uh, doing great work for a grassroots organization that's trying to get uh, progressives or people on the left into office. I think, you know, it's you just you know, just through the board here, uh, win, 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 win. It's, it, yeah, it's been, it's been a, a good, a good turnaround for, for the, the kind of crapola year that like <laughs> the, the, the Rona year has been. Uh, so it's good to come out of the gate swinging after, uh, after all of uh, just 2020. <laughs> right. Now I don't want you to, like, like you mentioned, you don't want to, I don't want to dox you either, but uh, you said you're from Texas. So I want to mm -hmm. ask, how are things uh, where you know again you don't have to say where it is you are but where you are in Texas, uh, um, you know how I'll, how have things been since obviously the obviously uh, a combination of both the uh, horrendous storm and yeah. uh, your governor apparently uh, <sighs> saying uh, fuck it pandemic's <laughs> over. Yeah, uh, so like I, I'm I'll, I'll say that I'm in North Texas. Um, and so we we had uh, sh probably a good almost a, a a solid week of just being bogged down with the ice and where it did not get above like maybe the high teens for for a good three four days and I was rough like my parents uh, didn't have power for almost seventy two hours and I had some really dear friends with a newborn like not even a week old child uh, at home and they were without power for uh, I think close to four. 40 hours. So it was scary. Um, and, but things are kind of like back to normal now. Like everybody's got their, I was lucky enough that I live close enough to, uh, some essential cert, like a fire station that my power didn't go out that entire time. So my roommates and my animals and I were, were warm. Uh, we had some problems with our water, but, um, that, that was pretty short lived. So we were really lucky and we were really blessed, but I know a lot of folks, we're hit a lot harder here. Um, and, uh, it was upsetting. Um, and, and Ted Cruz's office has been getting at least, uh, two to three calls uh, a week for me, uh, calling for his resignation. Um, I actually just left a, like called and, and left a message, uh, with, uh, with a very, very nice young lady who tends to wind up answering my calls whenever I call into the Houston office. And, uh, you know, I try to be like really, really polite with the staff, uh, but very clear in my displeasure with Ted Cruz uh, and Greg Abbott's also, office has also started getting some of those calls from me as well. Um, so, yeah, any other Texans uh, out there listening to, to Doomed, like, uh, you know, if these assholes are going to, like, make our lives hell uh, with their shitty choices, then uh, the least they can do is have to listen to us complain about it. So call in and let them know that, you know the best thing they can do is leave public office forever. Right, right. I and mean, before before you reminded me that they're usually uh, an innocent staffer on the other line, I actually had imagined, like, you know, you calling in and, like, you know, you hearing Ted Cruz's voice on voicemail going like, hi, you've reached the office of Ted Cruz. And I was going to ask you to, uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, – Sort of give us a little taste of the type of voicemail you would. You, you oh would yeah, yeah, no, like, and I usually, I usually let my, uh, let my, my southern draw come out a little bit more, like, you know, um, you know, it's a conservative office, so like, uh, 
they 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 probably uh, 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 be a little more open into listening uh, if they think it's a, a man they're talking to. And I got a pretty deep voice for a lady, so I usually get away with that. And I just kind of let my southern draw. Hey, you know, I'm a concerned constituent. And I just wanted to call. You know, let Ted Cruz know. You know, if if he's uh, interested in uh, 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 supporting the working class, like he he says, then uh, you know he he can maybe like. Uh, vote in favor of the pro act and and not just tweet some stuff on twitter you know um uh you know hey you know you know i'm sure i hope you know ted cruz had a nice time in cancun but you know i think it was pretty lousy that he bailed on his job and then uh you know with the uh all all that uh personal responsibility shtick go and blame his kids for, <laughs> for his poor decisions you know i don't <laughs> think that's very responsible um and then today like when i talked to him i made sure to let him know that you know, biden's a better conservative than he'll ever be um <laughs> no, I'm like, uh, I'm like, I'm sure that'll probably will hopefully get under his skin. But I, I know, you know, I, I'm not a billionaire. I don't, I'm not, I'm not. Wait, you're, I'm not you're, super. You're, uh, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're not. You mean the grassroots, not, or, the grassroots like, organization uh, <laughs> for city council seats isn't paying you a billion dollars? Not, not, not a billionaire. Um, and so you know, I know that. It's fall like my calls are falling on deaf ears. Like I don't have the kind of money to get somebody like Ted Cruz to actually listen to me. So it's really just a practice of self catharsis. Like <laughs> you know, it's so it's something for my own soul to like do. Listen, th I do want to say this though. Uh, you're right that uh, your singular call and your singular concern isn't being listened to by them, but. When your call adds up with all the other hundreds and thousands of calls they receive saying the same thing, then they start to worry about things. So, yeah. so it's it really isn't all for naught. Like if you're just That's doing true. it by like you know, are they hearing my personal concern? Probably no. not. Are they hearing the uh, the broader concern from uh, hundreds of that and thousands of people? Hundreds and thousands, I should say. It would yeah. be great if hundreds of thousands of people well, were calling, but I, we're not quite yeah. there. I don't think. But, uh, <laughs> Then, I, yeah, I they definitely do uh, uh, worry about that. For sure. And I will say some, some of the times that I call, I do – like it is like, I'm sorry. But there are too many callers right now. Like please leave a message or try calling back later because like our – please hold because our staff is like – talking to other people right now so like their their lines do get uh a little full sometimes i'm hoping that's other people also calling it like me right right well tony from texas thank you so much for calling in uh and saying all those especially thank you for saying all those nice <laughs> things about me i mean that's more pe i just want to say more people need to call into this show and do that that's how that's how it works uh, uh but yeah have a great night uh hope you uh uh call in again uh, in future episodes yeah, I'll look forward to it. Thanks for your time. Have a great evening. Take care. Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let's go back to the Super Chats. I'm going to keep the phone lines open still. Uh, oh, I saw someone in the chat. Let me explain what's going on here. Uh, Miss Heathen says, is there something in your eyes, Matt? Holy fuck, are you okay? You're blinking a lot. Uh, there is a combination of two things going on, actually. There is something in my eye. I don't. It's been in there since the beginning of the show. Uh, I don't know what it is. It goes. It, it comes and goes. So it's not that detrimental, but it's still there. It's probably like an eyelash or something. But number two, the reason I'm looking a lot, it's something I do when I'm really tired. Um, some Thursdays, I'm able to pull off the uh, the uh, double header of co-hosting the majority report and then doing this show a few hours later while also working in between like writing for my full-time job in between um and other days i guess it just hits me and i feel tired uh i do feel like i'm able to turn on and deliver for the most part no matter what but i guess you can tell from a physical standpoint uh, with my eyes, at the very least, that sometimes uh, I can't pull it off. I, 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 I don't know what to do about it because it's a. You guys have come to know to listen to the show on Thursdays, um, and I think Thursdays is one of the better nights for this show. But some days maybe it would be helpful to not do the show on a Thursday. Maybe maybe I'll I'll keep doing Thursdays for the most part, but. Certain weeks where I'm feeling the, the tiredness coming on, maybe I'll I'll do a 
a, a Wednesday night or maybe a, a Friday night or a Saturday night show instead. Uh, but back to what uh, Samantha said, congrats on hitting 200 patrons. Thank you, Samantha. I really appreciate that. It, you know, I, I, I'm very happy about that. Peter with a $20 super chat. Whoa. Uh, Bobert, maybe, uh, got her GED while running for Congress, and her restaurant is known for servers carrying Glocks, like Life Aquatic with Steve uh, Zissou. Uh, and giving 80 people diarrhea at a rodeo, often referenced by Matt Leck. Right. Well, I don't think it's a big deal that she got her GED while running for Congress. I mean, I don't really care about that. Uh, I feel like you should be able to be to run for Congress and get elected uh, no matter what your education level is. I mean, we should have people in Congress who didn't graduate from high school or college. Because there are many people living in this country who didn't graduate from high school or college. And I'm sure there are experiences those people have that people who did graduate don't experience. And the people living in this country uh, who didn't graduate should have someone who represents them. I don't think that's... What makes her disgusting and toxic are her beliefs and her ideas and what she espouses. Which I can tell you uh, there are very well-educated people who espouse and believe those same very horrible, toxic things. It has nothing to do with her education. Uh, but everything else you said is is true. Yes, the restaurant is known for its gun theme. And she did give 80 people diarrhea while catering, while her, when her restaurant catered an event. Right. I didn't follow the rules. Socially Democrat with the super chat says, oh, and this is the one that reminded me earlier in the show about the super chats. Do you get more money from YouTube or from Patreon? Patreon. Uh, YouTube is definitely nice. Uh, the super chats can be helpful. Uh, the advertising is pretty much non-existent. But there are a few dollars, I want to say, every month from the ads. But the Patreon is definitely the main source of uh, income for this show. Not my main source of income. My main source of income is my, my full-time job. It would be nice if it was this, but we're not there yet. Um, but the, um, the show's main source of income is Patreon. I mean, you could pretty much tell how much I'm making on Patreon. I, I don't have the uh, the earnings listed publicly. Um, I will list it publicly for I, I want to be transparent about it. But quite honestly, I felt like when it was lower, it might have deterred people from becoming a patron because people like to sign up and subscribe to things that they see are also popular and they don't have that sense of urgency for things that they don't view as popular. That's just how, that's, that honestly is just like the psychology behind all this. And I felt that was going to work against me. <laughs> um, I'm being honest with you. I'm being transparent. But I think we're at a point now where I can make it public soon. And... Um, and that's and the, the the psychology won't affect people, but yeah, you could pretty much guess. You could see that there's two hundred and seven or two hundred and eight. Again, Patreon hasn't updated with the latest patrons that joined yet. Um, but you can see how many patrons there are around two hundred or so. Times that by five. Most people who listen to the show do give me the five dollar donation. There are a few people who give a little bit less. There's a few people who give a little bit more. But when it comes down to it, 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 it evens out to about $5 per person. I think it's a little bit less, like $4 and change with it being close to 5 uh, And you can pretty much see right there how many people, uh, how much money the show makes from Patreon. Uh, peasant chick with a super chat. You should go on Left Reckoning or have Matt David and David come on here. I would love to have them on the show. and I'm going to ask them to come on the show. 
Um, true story, unfortunately. Um, last year, I had planned to have uh, Matt Leck on the show when he was uh, feuding with the... Uh, the uh uh ooh, the I'm having a mental block. The intellectual dark web Weinsteins. And I was gonna have him come on this show to do an episode about the fake liberal IDW Weinstein brothers. And then that was going to be an introduction a a a, uh, a opening for the following week's episode, which I was going to ask Michael Brooks to come on the show to talk his new book. Um, I had actually reached out to Matt and uh, or, or I hadn't reached out to him yet. I was going to. And then uh, we got the news about Michael. And so obviously that didn't happen. Um, you know, that's also one of the things about the, uh, the, um, the pandemic, uh, I probably would have asked Michael to come on this show in April when his book was released any other year, but then I just got sidetracked with doing with, with the, 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 um, with the, COVID stuff and the lockdowns and being home and, and doing shows related to that. That uh, and, and Michael wasn't doing a book tour, obviously, because there was no touring. So it just didn't even occur to me to have him on the show when, in April when it came out. And then, you know, uh, June came around and then there was the BLM stuff and the protests around that. And then... July, I was like, oh, let's, 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 I wanted to get Michael on about his book. And I was literally, like, I literally had it on the schedule. Of, I have, like, a, a sheet where I plan out, like, oh, I should have this person on this week. Uh, and I was literally going to reach out to Michael that week. Uh, and then, uh, and Matt Luck. And then, uh, yeah. So, unfortunately, Matt Leck has not yet been on this show, but he will be. Um, Midnight Pizza Mom with a super chat. You're a wrestling fan and don't watch Batchamania, Matt? Oh, is that what you were referencing? I am the table. Right, right. I used to watch it a lot more. I used to be, oh, look, the new episode. Let's watch it. I haven't seen one in, in a little bit. I'll tell you, it's been very hard to watch pro wrestling uh, over the past year. Not having a crowd there really does make a big difference. There's no one to guide the storylines to let Vince and the writers know that a certain character sucks or a certain angle sucks. So we're just getting everything that they write and they're seeing it out. And I think there's been a lot of stuff that just hasn't been very good to be quite frank. Um, Mariah with a super chat. I am in a study group reading Lenin right now. So I missed the stream. But hi, Matt. Oh, that's very cool, Mariah. I think that's a fine reason to miss miss the show. Um, I will say though that uh, we got to get on the uh, the uh, movie night plans. I need to figure out what movie to do. Maybe maybe we should watch. Uh, maybe we should watch the Pillow Guys uh, movie. That could be fun. What was it called again? Oh, I can't even remember. I can't even remember. But we should watch uh, the My Pillow Guy. 
Oh my god. I'm just yawning on the stream. I'm just oh man, I'm just I'm just wrecked, man. I'm just <laughs> uh Kitty's Kitty's Hooch. That's a that's quite the username. But I'm reading it because how could I not appreciate a ten dollar super chat? Thanks for the stream. Left is best. You're welcome, Kitty's Hooch. I appreciate it. Uh, Thomas Mun uh, uh, M with a super chat that's just a beautiful little heart sticker with the words thanks. Thank you, Thomas or Tomas. I'm sorry if it's Tomas. I'm not sure which it is, Thomas or Tomas. Thank you very much. I truly appreciate it. Oh, right. Thank you, Chris and Ryan. The uh, My Pillow Guy, Mike Lindell's documentary is called Absolute Proof. And the way you can remember the name of that documentary, and I'll, I'll try to recall this so I never forget again, is that it obviously shows the absolute proof that Donald Trump won the 2020 election, which we all know, right? Uh, Donald Trump uh, had the election stolen from him, and he really is the true rightful president of the United States. And just to make sure that I don't get uh, banned from YouTube, I want to make it clear that everything I just said is uh, a joke, not true, uh, was dripping with sarcasm, and everything else I've ever said on this channel should be proof of that. Um, Andy with the Super Chat says, do Louise Linton, who is uh, Mnuchin's wife, do her movie, Me, You, Madness. I, I missed this. She she has a movie? Wait, what did I just click here? Whoops. Me, You, Madness. What is this all about? What is this all about? Uh, me, I'm going to the Wikipedia here. Me, You Madness is a 2021 American comedy thriller film written and written, directed, and produced by Louise Linton in her directorial debut. It stars Linton and Ed West Westwick. Uh, who is Ed Westwick? Uh, he is best known for his role as Chuck Bass on CW's Gossip Girl. Hmm. Okay. He also was in Children of Men, which is a great movie. But let's um go back to the Meet You Madness Wikipedia page here. Uh, the plot. Is one sentence on Wikipedia. A thief cases a home in Malibu only to discover it is owned by a female serial killer. Hmm. Uh, hmm. Let's move to the critical reception here. Me, You, Madness received negative reviews from film critics. It holds an 18% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes based on 11 reviews. Hmm. I want to see this. Let's go to the Rotten Tomatoes review page. Oh, boy. This looks... I don't even know. Uh, the audience score is 92%, though. That's weird. Catherine Black is a brilliant, ruthless businesswoman who runs a top hedge fund in L.A. But below her fabulous, feminine, ice-cold public facade, she is privately and proudly a murderous psychopath. Enter Tyler Jones, a handsome young con man who turns up at Catherine's Malibu mansion by a too-good-to-be-true listing for a room for rent. Unfortunately, Tyler is unaware he's about to turn out to be her next victim. 
after being roofied and romanced by Catherine and her slinky model girlfriend, Tyler is swept up in his new life of riches and romance, blissfully ignorant that in between her board meetings and spin classes, Catherine partakes in serial murders and gruesome dismemberments. But sex and a stolen vintage Mustang with a corpse crammed in the trunk complicates their mutual scheming. And when Tyler discovers a freezer full of body parts in her garage, Catherine uses everything, including a broken martini glass, a hedge trimmer, a crossbow, and a chainsaw to break up and chop up Tyler, all while struggling to keep his blood and her boudoir off the custom-made white couches. So will the guy get the girl? Or will the girl gut the guy? Did this just give it away? What the hell? Uh, Frank Sheck of The Hollywood Reporter says to call this a vanity project is an insult to vanity projects. Uh, Wade Major of Film Week, a female version of American Psycho, shot like a car commercial. Uh, Mark Dutschik of Mark Reviews Movies. Me, you, madness is a special kind of trash, a piece that's convinced it's priceless treasure. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, Brian Orndorff of Blu-ray.com. It's an ego-drenched production that doesn't become the violent cartoon it wants to be. Uh, Robert Kojder of Flickering Myth says, There is madness all right here. I almost went fucking mad watching it. Peter Hammond of Deadline, Hollywood Daily. It never meets the moment of what Linton clearly hoped it would be. A kind of smart, Heathers-like black comedy. It ultimately is just too vapid to be memorable and that way too disciplined, undisciplined to really work to the levels which it aspires. Man. Interestingly enough, one of the only good reviews here is from a film critic who writes for Salon. What's a Salon writer giving Mnuchin's wife a good review? Jeez. Uh, oh, watch the fucking trailer, says Zoe. All right, all right. Zoe, are you calling in? What's going on here? Hello? Hello. Look at hey. the chat. Okay, I'm looking. You want me to watch the trailer? Yes. Okay. Let's let's watch the trailer. Okay, let's let's do it. Let's watch the trailer. Give me a second here. Um, it'll be better if I download it because otherwise, it's gonna go a little bit slow. Oh, uh, a uh, interesting uh, update for patrons here. Thanks to all of you. And the, ability, and the ability you've all given me, thanks to the funding of the show, to um, upgrade equipment, I will be soon streaming off of a new computer that will enable me to do a lot more things that I think I haven't been able to do on this old laptop. Uh, one of those things is uh, stream more of what I'm just doing with a screen share. But anyway, just downloaded the uh the movie. Let's let's watch. Not the movie, the trailer. Let's watch. This is one of the Me You Madness trailers. My name is Catherine Black. You may think that I'm a materialistic, narcissistic, self-absorbed misanthrope. I don't deny it. I'm a hedge fund manager. I'm addicted to fashion, the accumulation of money, exercise, and sex. My life is incredible. Hi. I have an appointment about running the room. Nice digs. You got a plastic Mustang? Your left. Every single day. I had a soft spot for him. Who knew? I hadn't felt a soft spot for anything since I was six. Very sexy. 
Don't get carried away. Keep your focus on the task at hand. How did I not see it coming? You thieving little twit. Oh, I have to pull myself together. I think I'm going to disembowel this kid and kill him. You got the car? I'm taking the car back. I think I really like this girl. I really think we can make this work. You stole from me. You're crazy. Is that a curling iron? You can do what exactly with that, huh? Okay, maybe I was wrong about the curling iron. That really escalated. No! I'm madly in love with you. I really appreciate that. Stop! There's no need to escalate this to the point of no return. That's subjective, sweetheart. Can we take a water break? That'd be nice. Maybe we should get married. First of all, I want to point out that her company, her production company name is uh, Storm Chaser Films. Uh, <laughs> okay, if, if he, is that a, is that a, a little bit close to Stormfront for me? But uh, she's really bad actress. First of all, she's really bad. Also, did you notice she was like coming in and out of an accent? Like half of what she like her the narration she was doing had like a British accent, but when she was actually talking in the movie, she had no British accent. Uh, but my take is that it honestly feels like she did this movie and put herself in it so she could make out and hang out with a rather good-looking young actor from a hit CW show. I mean, she is married to Steve Mnuchin. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it seems like this was her way of uh, getting some uh, other... Uh, hooking up with someone who isn't Steve Mnuchin. <laughs> I, I will say it, it actually the beginning of that trailer started out not so bad. I thought it, it had potential. And then you could tell the movie falls apart because that's what they put together. The rest is what they put together for the trailer. I mean, it just doesn't seem like a very good movie. Um man. I mean I guess the highlight is that I guess she is uh, uh, sh she is a fan of those movies, which is why she's trying to do them. Because uh, I'm a big fan of uh, dark comedies, black comedies, uh, horror comedies, thriller comedies. Uh, but this doesn't look like it's very good. Uh, Daniel with a super chat. Are we ever going to get a better visual metaphor for QAnon hard calendar dates than the ending of AEW Revolution? Ooh. For those who don't know what we're talking about, for you non-wrestling fans, so at AEW, which is like the second biggest wrestling company after WWE, at their big uh, wrestling event this past Sunday, their main event was a Japanese death match. And in a Japanese death match, at the end of the match, there's like a, a timer, like the, there's a, a time limit. And at the end of that time limit, the ring explodes. And anyone who's in it, obviously, explodes with it. And they did this whole gimmick where one of the wrestlers, uh, John Moxley, was passed out in the middle of the ring. One of his allies, uh, uh, Eddie Kingston, runs out. Tries to get him out of the ring. He's too knocked out. So Eddie Kingston lays over him as the countdown clock hits zero. And the ring explodes. However, I don't know what they were thinking or if the rig failed. But the explosion ended up being 
uh, like four very small blasts outside the ring and the equivalent of sparklers coming up out of like the, the turnbuckle sides. And that was it. You could still see the ring completely during all of this. There wasn't even enough smoke to like make it look cool. And Eddie uh, Kingston and Moxley acted like they were knocked out in the ring when this all happened and didn't get back up. Uh, and everyone's been talking about this in the wrestling world. Uh, so yeah, it is actually a perfect visual metaphor for the consistently failing QAnon dates. Uh, Paradise for the super chat. Watch the trailer, Matt. I did. Thank you for letting me know. Socially Democrat with a super chat that says tips. Thank you. And Logan with a super chat that just says, Matt, go to sleep, buddy. You've done enough for the day. There's actually quite a few uh, comments in the chat telling me to just go to bed already. They can tell I'm tired. I think I'm going to take that advice. Uh... Uh, space, no, no, space is, oh, I get it, it's a Hiroshima thing. No, no, actually, that's not why it's called the Japanese Deathmatch, or, it's literally called the Japanese Deathmatch because it originated from the wrestling federations in Japan. All right, now I'm awake, because there's, I gotta give you a little, a little breakdown here. All right, so, there are a few major pro wrestling markets. The United States, Canada, Mexico, Japan, and then the UK has been sort of making a name for itself in recent years. But the, 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 historically, the major wrestling markets are the US, Canada, Japan, and Mexico. Now, that's, I'm not putting it in any order there. All those countries are, are seeped with wrestling history. Uh, Canada sort of has lost their... Their major wrestling promotions over the years. I, I can't think of. I know Impact is is out of Canada now, but they're not really. I don't consider them a Canadian wrestling organization. But um, uh, whereas the U.S. had like WWE and at the time WCW, ECW, and then at a time TNA and now AEW. Uh, Mexico has uh. Uh, uh, AAA, which is their one of their big wrestling federations, and uh, CMLL. Uh, I, I actually never knew if it's pronounced CMLL or CMLL. Uh, those are the big wrestling federations there. Like literally, like the WWEs of that country, like they're huge, multi-million-dollar organizations. Um, and in Japan, there are actually a ton of wrestling promotions. Japanese has a huge wrestling market. Right now, the big wrestling uh, company in Japan is uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling. But over the years, they've had a, a lot. Uh, FMW, uh, 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 All Japan Pro Wrestling, uh, uh, Pro Wrestling Noah, uh, you know, and, and women's wrestling is really big in Japan. So that's why it's called the Japanese uh, Deathmatch. Literally, the Japanese wrestling organizations originated that that type of match. Um, Tronin says how they explained why the ring didn't explode in the storylines on AEW show Dynamite, but it was confirmed in real life to be a pyro botch. Uh, Daniel says it was embarrassing for poor Eddie Kingston, right? Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is the show for today. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, as always, subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Matt Binder. Follow me all across social media. Um, if you're not already a patron subscriber, if you're listening live still, uh, most of you listening now are patrons though. Uh, but if you're not, uh, patreon.com slash Matt Binder. Once again, thank you patrons for supporting this show and getting me past this, uh, old, this goal, uh, onto the next goal. Right. Uh, until then, see you all next time on doomed.